bit on what you what you just said so we want to tell you something about the communicative potential of pantomic reenactments of events in two types of actors in a competent that we call competent actor and a naive actor and uh, the uh, presented research it is a pilot study so that's not uh, that's something we want to we want to extend in the future but it is a part of a bigger study that Przemek was presenting uh, two presentations ago. Uh, that is a research project currently going on in Torun, Poland, at the Center uh, for Language Evolution Studies at the Nicolas Copernicus University, where we are uh, well, pushing to the limits all of our students to do stuff for us. And as they, um, as they become our actors, we have a standard procedure of presenting them with 20 images so these are the images that you've already seen, uh, that we have different uh, characters. These are uh, male and female, adult and children characters performing different actions to each other. Mm -hmm. And in a big research project, uh, we also conducted uh, post-study reviews among the guesses, and we found out a couple of interesting things. One of them was that out of uh, 60 guesses, uh, 17 overtly stated that the more pantomime was rich in detail, the easier it was for them to match it with the correct image, while only two stated overtly the opposite. But this, of course, is self-reported. So we wondered, well, first of all, how to elicit a more detailed pantomime from a performer, and then are there actually any differences in the communicative potential uh, of a more and less detailed pantomime? And I will explain in a moment what exactly we mean by that. So what do we understand by pantomime? Uh, actually, we understand the same thing as Przemek said, so I won't repeat. Uh, there will be a little bit of a twist uh, on the whole body aspect of pantomime. What do we understand by a more detailed pantomime? So, of course, intuitively, a more detailed pantomime will carry more meaning or will carry some additional meaning as compared to a less detailed pantomime. Uh, but we also link it uh, with um, the dramatic or theatrical aspect of pantomime. So the need for the call for a greater athleticism in a more detailed pantomime. Uh, in theater studies, uh, this is actually sometimes referred to as a waste of energy on the part of the performer. Uh, certainly, pantomime can incorporate all sorts of exaggerations in terms of movements, uh, a lot of mockery, especially of mannerisms of uh, characters presented, and exaggerated facial expressions as well, which you will see in a moment. What do we understand by communicative potential? Uh, so we wondered basically uh, whether a pantomimic reenactment will be understandable to a general audience, and again we checked it. Uh, by uh, means of a guessing game in which guessers were asked to identify a reenactment to match it uh, with an image that served originally as an input for the performer. So in our study we asked two performers uh, to communicate some situations and one of them was what we call a competent one. Uh, so a trained actor, uh, in our results we mark uh, him as an A-type actor and a naive one, I will elab elaborate on the distinction in a moment. They were given um, exactly the same instructions, we asked them to communicate a situation with their whole bodies without the use of words and without the use of conventional gestures. And they were given exactly the same input, so the same matrix of images in the, exactly the same order. Uh, we recorded 20 uh, reenactments from each of the performers and presented them to two groups of 30 guesses each. Uh, and they took part in a guessing game on the basis of pen and paper method. Our hypothesis based on the self-reports from the bigger project was that reenactments by competent performers will ha have higher communicative potential than those by naive ones. And now on the distinction. So what we look at 
is basically the performer's background. And by a competent performer, we mean someone which basically has better motor skills and will produce a more robust pantomime. So a person with previous acting or um, acting experience or training, um, a person who had um, something to do with movement training, dance training and or pantomime training, uh, and or had stage experience. Um, in our case, in the case of our study, it was an amateur actor uh, who had two-year professional acting training um, and was one of our students. The other student that we asked to perform um, had no acting experience or training, no stage experience, and had average motor skills. So once again, they were given exactly the same instructions and exactly the same input, and I will show you what they produced. So this is the competent performer. And this is the so-called naive one. <laughs> so hopefully you can see quite clearly uh, the differences between the two. Uh, so in the competent performer um, incorporated more of whole body uh, movements and what is interesting, he actually was very consistent with that. So throughout the session, the recording session, uh, he invested just as much energy for the whole uh, time. So he didn't simplify his movements in any way. Um, his movements had greater span. He also incorporated some indicators of emotions. So you can see from the facial expressions that he tries to communicate something like anger or annoyance. Um, he also embodied two characters, so he showed the situation from the perspective of two characters. He copied the physical orientation of the image that served uh, as the input, while the naive performer uh, relied more on, on hand movements. And what is interesting is that at the beginning of the recording session, he moved more around the space uh, that he was given, and then towards the end, his movements were becoming more and more uh, simplified and they relied more on just, he relied more just on hand movements rather than his whole body. Um, so he worked out this set of simplified hand movements to indicate uh, age, to indicate sex of the characters from the situation and also the type of movement that they performed. Um, he did not shift his posture much towards the end of the recording session. He was also emotionally blank. Uh, as you could see, he had quite a blank facial expressions, uh, expression. Uh, he also communicated agent and patient roles uh, from the situation, from the image, uh, using the SVO order, which is the most natural one in spoken Polish language. So what can we observe in these pantomimes? So as we've heard uh, today also in the, in the emerging uh, sign languages uh, research, so both spoken and sign language aims at minimizing effort and maximizing its communicative potential. It means that, as we've also discussed uh, along your presentation, that the movement span is becoming smaller, but it's also similar for spoken language that you're producing faster and smaller utterances to, communica to communicate uh, the same kind of message. But in, uh, sign in emerging sign languages, we know it is also the case, for example, a sign may start with a pantomimic reenactment, re then turn into gesture, then conventionalize it itself along the use into a sign of a sign uh, vocabulary. For example, for Polish sign language, um, because we've got, in Polish Sign Language, we've got a fairly small vocabulary, so we've got around, around three, three and a half thousand of lexical items. If there is a new word introduced, it may take more time and it may be more, it may be bigger in terms of span of the movement until it conventionalizes into a smaller form. Also in the context, so for example, in, it's, I think it's similar to American Sign Language for coffee, but you make it like this in Polish. So if you ask someone, how do you say coffee, coffee, um, 
and then they would show you this. But when they are asking you for coffee, they would just do like that. So they wouldn't really exaggerate on the movement. So as we were uh, collecting our data, that's one of the answer sheets from one of the participants. They were given this kind of uh, paper and they could see the matrix throughout the whole study. Uh, they had a brief instruction, an, exam uh, an example of how they should uh, encode the, 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 the answers and they should match the film with the number of the picture from the matrix. Um, so yeah, we were wondering if, uh, if uh, exaggerated pantomime is easier to be guessed than, uh, than the simplified form of pantomime. We didn't really find any uh, significant result, but then we thought since there was this conventionalization process in the second actor, perhaps there would be a learning effect visible also in, on, the, on the guessing side. So we removed uh, from both, uh, from both uh, actors, we removed the first five videos and we were left only with the 15 remaining ones. And as here, the non-significant result was at the point uh, eight almost, uh, the, the p-value. Right here, for the removed ones, also with the outlayers, it was point four. So we think perhaps there is something to it. If we made a more, more extended, more, you know, uh, more pictures, more actors maybe, um, and more participants, of course, perhaps we could obtain a significant result. So, yeah, to conclude, uh, the background of performers seem to determine the type of pantomime they use in the reenactment of events. Um, naive performers' uh, pantomime started to resemble a language-like structure in the sense it was resembling the spoken Polish language having the structure of, of SVO. Uh, sign language structure is SOV in Polish because it comes from German sign language. Um, none of the strategies seem to have an advantage over, over the other, although we assume we can see a tendency towards uh, the easier pantomime being, uh, being, being uh, better and easier to guess uh, for our, for our um, participants. Uh, so definitely, as Monika said, we want to uh, extend the study and we want to do so bearing in mind the following questions, which are very general and open for discussion. So can we see the two types of pantomime as competing or concurrent, perhaps, uh, communicative strategies? So for instance, if a person would have to communicate uh, in a single situation with a limited group of people, um, they can stick to whichever strategy, but if the communication happens over extended period of time and in a larger group, perhaps the second strategy would be better. Uh, can the same person um, use those strategies interchangeably? So is it possible to elicit a more detailed and more dramatic pantomime from a naive performer? Uh, and what contributes in a given communicative situation to the choice of a strategy by a particular person? Can they work perhaps better in different communicative scenarios? So can they uh, serve different purposes perhaps? So we thought, for instance, about linking the first type of pantomime with ritual, which uh, in anthropological studies and ritual studies is sometimes envisaged as in a way empty of meaning or meaningless in a sense that carrying meaning is not its primary function. And then the second time may serve, uh, for instance, for information transfer or coordination of action. Um, and then a very big and general question, can we then perhaps uh, think, consider uh, two trajectories of the development of pantomime in human communication? So this will be all. Thank you very much for your time and attention.